Welcome, thank you for tuning in. I'm John Hickman, and I'm here with Darby and Jerry Nelson to talk about Darby's new book. It's called For Love of a River, the Minnesota. And it's a finalist for this year's Midwest Independent Publishers Association Award for Best Nature Book. And it's much more than a nature book. Darby set out to write something that had never been attempted before, an all-encompassing biography of our state's namesake river. His book recounts the incredible geological history of the river, the arrival of European American colonists and conflicts with the native Dakota people, and the transformation from a prairie and wetland landscape to one dominated by commercial agriculture. He describes the rich diversity of the river's flora and fauna and spotlights inspirational, inspirational citizen activists dedicated to helping restore the Minnesota River. My favorite chapters are the ones about Darby and Jerry canoeing on the river. They paddled all 335 miles from the South Dakota border to the confluence with the Mississippi in St. Paul. Darby fell in love with the Minnesota River growing up in the small town of Morton, across the river from Redwood Falls and the Lower Sioux Indian community. He has a PhD in ecology from the University of Minnesota, taught biology at Anoka Ramsey Community College for 35 years, and served three terms in the Minnesota legislature. He has been a tireless advocate for the environment, having served on boards for the Nature Conservancy, the Freshwater Society, and Conservation Minnesota. His first book, For Love of Lakes, published in 2012, was a finalist for the Minnesota Book Award in Creative Nonfiction. A good part of Darby's success as a writer can be attributed to Jerry. In addition to being Darby's paddling companion for life, she's a retired high school science teacher herself, and she provides valuable input on his manuscripts. Darby and Jerry completed the first draft of For Love of a River, the Minnesota in 2016, and then he and Jerry asked me to help them bring the book to publication. Let me tell you how this book came to be. It was a race against Alzheimer's. Darby was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment in 2011, just before For Love of Lakes came out. And the next year and a half, we were traveling the state and the country uh, talking about that book. Um, in 2013, we began paddling sections of the river and uh, doing the research and writing of the book, which was completed in 2016. Now it was ready for the polishing um, revisions. And the Alzheimer's had advanced to the point where Darby had, it was hard for him to make decisions on, on um, organization and the, the best way to say something. So we realized that we needed help, and John Hickman, our friend, a writer, and editor, and an expert on the Minnesota River, was the perfect person to step in. It didn't take him long to find Darby's voice. And he stayed true to the story so that we couldn't tell the, what he had altered. The writing of the book slowed the progress of Darby's Alzheimer's, and it has given the Minnesota citizens an important and timely book on Southwest Minnesota. Darby still has lots of wisdom and good ideas in his head, but it's hard for him to get them out. So John and I have to do most of the talking. We know you'll enjoy Darby's story, so let's paddle the Minnesota River. We started at Browns Valley at the bulge in the, the western side of Minnesota 
and went on to the confluence with the Mississippi at St. Paul. There are three big lakes at the beginning of the river dammed, uh, dammed up. Uh, big Stone Lake at Ortonville was the first one. Marsh Lake, where my dad used to hunt ducks, and um, Lac of Parle. <coughs> when we got to Morton, Darby's um, place of his heart, it was just a thrill to get there by water, uh, by the river, rather than by highway. Morton is famous for the Morton Nice, one of the oldest rocks in the world and certainly the most beautiful. Paddling is easy on the peaceful river, but we avoided high water so that we could camp on sandbars and, and avoid the, the strong currents that come at, at flood stage. So what did we do as we were paddling along the river? besides enjoying a, a quiet morning fog. We uh, tested the water clarity regularly, a couple times a day at least, used a Secchi disc in the lakes, uh, which there are many in the, in the valley and the basin, and a Secchi tube in rivers, which we had never used before, but so it's got that, that same uh, disc, only much smaller, fill the tube with river water, and lower the the um, tube or the disc down until you can't see it. Bring it back up until you can see it again, and average those two figures, and you get a really good idea of how clear the water is. Darby's curiosity um, made him want to get up on top of the bank if he couldn't see what was up there, <clears throat> and it didn't matter if you couldn't get up the bank. He he did it some way or other. I never went up with him at all. We looked for good landings and places to sit. And um, journal writing time came several times a day to keep track of what we were seeing and, and enjoying. We ate simple food by homemade granola and one pot suppers. We ran just a few rapids. Um, Patterson Rapids was kind of a rock garden. This is Carver Rapids. And um, Granite Falls, there's a, a nice rapids just below the dam in Gra Granite Falls, and John is going to read a little section from that chapter. A steep slope drops off from the edge of the park to the river, making it a bit dicey to carry the canoe down to the water. But we're wearing sensible shoes, and all goes well. As we load the canoe on a strand of sand, I see a huge mass of fingernail clams, apparently brought together by currents. I suspect catfish must be frequent visitors to this site. The roiling current below the dam splays itself broadly across the river, revealing rock-studded places that call for caution. Jerry in the bow, can spot danger ahead, while I, in the stern, am responsible for steering. A rapid dialogue ensues as we snake our way through the hazards. Jerry is very skilled at her task, and over the years, I've become proficient at following her instructions. We zip through to calmer water. We're seeing at least one eagle every day, not surprising given the abundance of fish in the river, carp are jumping and splashing all around us. Eagles are actually one of the more common avian sightings on the river, yet they command one's attention every time. Less than a mile downstream, we run into our first real rapids, actually what we call our rock garden, with rocks scattered hither and yon at or just below the surface. The current isn't particularly strong, but the obstacles are ubiquitous, and despite our best efforts, the canoe gets wedged sideways between two boulders. We're able to stand on them and free the canoe with no problem, aside from getting our sensible shoes soaked. Oops. Um, we also enjoyed seeing wildlife on the river. These are illustrations from the book. 
and um, <coughs> clams or mussels are, have, are coming back in the Minnesota River. They were um, really in trouble years ago. Um, Yellow-headed blackbirds, um, pelicans, uh, periodically our favorite big bird. And the eagles, of course, we were seeing eagles every single day. It was really exciting. The soft-shelled turtles would plop into the water as soon as they um, saw us coming, and uh, so we never got really close to them. Great blue heron are always fun to watch. And we now have um, bison in Miniopa State Park near uh, Mankato. There were fishermen all along the river, and we talked to all of them. They um, told us how good the walleye and catfish fishing was, and it's a great place to catch a wide variety of fish. Freshwater drum, paddlefish, carp, sturgeon, gar, bullfins, American eel, bullheads, white bass. The DNR has counted 102 species in the Minnesota River, so it's really a good place to have a lot of fun fishing. When we were in, in Franklin, just, just down river from Morton, we heard about Franklin's catfish derby days while we were getting water up in town. And John is gonna read a little piece from that. Darby and Jerry went back a couple weeks later to take in the derby days. On the last weekend in July, we drive to Franklin with our daughter and her family. Our first stop is the Highway 5 landing where a gaggle of spectators is watching a woman wielding one of her 12 fillet knives. She is, of course, cleaning catfish. She dispatches each fish with alacrity and precision. There will be plenty of fish all winter in her household. A lively discussion ensues about the taste of various fish. The consensus is catfish tastes better than walleye. Anglers are obliged to use stout tackle if they want to have a fighting chance of reeling in a big cat. The boats at the landing have flat bottoms for navigation in shallow water. They are well stocked with hefty rods and reels, big landing nets, and coolers. Back in town, we check out the huge tank of writhing catfish where the DNR fisheries expert is taking in and weighing them for the contest, as well as making sure they stay well hydrated until they can be returned to the river. Our daughter's reaction? They sure aren't the cutest of fish. But the grandkids? Can we pet them? Yes, under the watchful eye of the DNR expert. The biggest cat so far this year, caught by a guy from nearby Sleepy Eye, weighs 31 pounds. The biggest one caught since the contest debuted in 1976 was 52 pounds 5 ounces. Minnesota fisher folk are justified in boasting that this river is home to world-class cats. The last leg of our journey was uh, from Lesseur to the Mississippi. And our daughter Robin and, and granddaughter Hallie um, did the, the shuttling for us. And we enjoyed um, some the, the first of the wild grapes that were um, growing along the river there. It was really interesting to go through the shipping terminals at the head of barge navigation. Um, and the tugboat captain was happy to talk to us and gave us lots of fun information. As we approached the conf confluence at Bedote, the silence was, was shattered by planes flying um, very low overhead coming into the Minneapolis-St. Paul airport. And um, the freeway bridges were huge, and, um, and this is the, the landing where we re returned to after we got to the to the um, confluence right here at uh, Pike Island, Fort Snelling State Park at Bedote. So we realized here that 
you know, the, the river doesn't really totally end at, um, at the Mississippi. And John coined the phrase Minnesi Mississippi River because um, the Minnesota and the Mississippi come together and um, go all the way to the Gulf. And that, um, that has huge, it, the, the pollution coming out of the Minnesota River has great um, effect on the Gulf as well as the, the towns below us. So we went to Pine Bend's Bluff Scientific and Natural Area, which is just downstream from the, where the Minnesota joins the Mississippi. And we came here to ponder what we'd learned. And John is going to read a little piece from that. From the top of Pine Bend's Bluff, Jerry and I take one last look at the river below. I feel as though I'm at least beginning to form an understanding of rock and ice, river and land, soil and lakes, and for 11,500 years of humans, a communion of the whole. We turn back toward the parking lot at just the right time to see a pair of bald eagles flying high above the bluff. Within my lifetime, I have witnessed the decline of eagles to the point of near extinction and the revival of their population to the point that they are a common sight along the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers. We saved the bald eagle and we can save the Minnesota River. Okay, so let's do a quick survey of the book. We start out with foundation chapters, six of them. Uh, Stone gives the geological history, including Morton Nice, which you'll see on the most beautiful buildings in Minneapolis, as well as downtown Anoka. Ice talks about the glacial history uh, soil, the incredibly uh, rich soil in the Minnesota River Basin. The people that came first and um, later, the Dakota-U.S. War, and the transformation from prairie and big woods to agriculture. There are six voices for the river stories of advocates that really made a difference in, in the Minnesota River um, to make, make things better. Very inspiring. We had to look at the lakes in the basin as well and, um, and went to 40 of them. And the, you'll, you can read about them and the ones in the upper basin, the middle basin, and the lower basin. It's amazing. You, you don't think of southwest Minnesota as lake country, but there are lots of lakes down there. So why is the Minnesota River especially vulnerable? You've seen this picture, perhaps, of the, of the um, muddy Minnesota coming into the clear Miss Mississippi. So why is it that way? First of all, the Minnesota is a geologically young river cutting through glacial till. Lots of sediment erodes naturally. White settlers cut down the big woods to provide building material and carve out farmland. There's only 1% of the big woods that's left. Fertile prairie soils produced outstanding crops, so more and more soil was broken. There's only 1% left. 99% of the prairie is gone. Countless wetlands were drained for more cropland, and only 10% is left, and that's one of the main problems. Clay soils in the basin need drainage to produce crops, so much of the basin is tiled, and this is a this doesn't look like tile to me, but that's, that's the, the, um, the way it looks and the way it's, it's um, put into the ground and brings water quickly to the, to the river. Moving water quickly off the land increases flooding. We feel so bad for the people in, in Henderson who can't get to their homes when it's flooded. Many farmers have given up on floodplain flood plan, flood planting as well. Factories have dumped waste and municipalities have dumped sewage into the river. Much of that has stopped. But <clears throat> we have more things that we can do to improve the quality of the Minnesota River. Plant rain gardens. This is our rain garden in our front yard. And, 
it's much more lush now. This was taken a few years ago. Keep our storm drains cleaned. Those leaves have lots of phosphorus in them that can um, screw up the, the chemistry of the, of the river water. So keep your storm drains, drains cleaned out in front of your house. Fix uh, septic systems and maintain sewage treatment facilities. We need to adopt agricultural best practices, cover crops like you see on the left, upper left there, no till like the upper right, buffers on the bottom, precision farming to prevent nitrogen and phosphorus and pesticides from washing away into the water, convert pl floodplains to perennial cover with CREP and other programs, and most of <clears> all, <throat> we need to keep water on the land longer. And the Minnesota River Congress has a petition that you can go online and sign. It's uh, at mnrivercongress.org. This, um, the petition ends with, I wholeheartedly support the efforts of the Minnesota River Congress, multiple partners and cooperators to work with state legislators, national le legislators and other elected officials to create a voluntary government in initiative that has significant resources targeted for temporary and permanent water storage on the landscape. Uh, the lobbyists from the Minnesota River Congress made a lot of progress in the last legislative se session and we hope that this will become law soon in Minnesota. The epilogue is called, it's what we do on the land and John will read from, from that. I spent my formative years on the Minnesota River and fell in love with it. And I have spent a good portion of my retirement years striving to get better acquainted with it, searching to understand why this river occupies such a powerful place in my heart and soul. There are places along the Minnesota River every bit as beautiful as anything I've seen in the Boundary Waters. Exploring the river by canoe is facilitated by numerous landing sites, campsites, and the detailed DNR water trails maps. The fishing is great, and the most significant events in the history of the state of Minnesota, the forced displacement of the native population and conversion of the landscape to the commodity-based agriculture that formed our economy took place in the Minnesota River Basin. My motivation in writing this book has been to help people learn about and appreciate the river I love. Awareness comes first, which leads to appreciation, which leads to a commitment to act. I invite you to get out and spend some time on the Minnesota River. You might just fall in love. Thank you, John. So to find out more about the, the book and, um, and the other book, For Love of Lakes, uh, you can go to darbynelson.com uh, or facebook.com slash darbynelsonbooks. Uh, you can get books from my Amazon, your book, your bookstores, and contact Darby and I from, from the website if you'd like. We'd love to sign them for you, and uh, we can certainly work that out. So we, we hope that you will um, get this book, read it, because it's really, it, it's um, an amazing book that's well written and uh, fun to read and will really increase your knowledge of the, of the um, Minnesota and the Minnesota River. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>